today the giant stones that speak of the mighty unassailable presence of the Holy One come tumbling down. It first happened in the year 586 BC when the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed and the inhabitants were taken into exile in Babylon. Seventy years later, these exiles return to Jerusalem and as they stand among the ruins God's vision for a new future pours forth out of the mouth of the prophet Isaiah in that first reading we heard. I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. In some of the most hopeful and challenging words ever written, the promise of a transformed world is offered. The Holy One wants more than just rebuilding. The Holy One wants a new world. In time, a second temple is built. Today, Jesus and his followers are standing outside that second temple. Some of his followers are admiring this magnificent and unshakable symbol of God's presence. But Jesus is not impressed. Instead, he responds to their admiration with a chilling prediction. As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left behind. All will be thrown down. It gets worse. Not only will these walls come tumbling down, but a whole apocalyptic nightmare will occur. The whole earth will be laid bare by famines and illness. Nothing will be left to impede our view. Embedded in this picture of mass destruction and suffering are instructions about how we as faithful followers are to live through these events with the help of God. And we are assured that even as we crawl out of the rubble, covered in dust, not a hair on our head will perish, and that these huge tests of endurance will bring us closer to the Holy One. And so we see that the Holy One does not reside within lavish solidity and the permanence of the temple. This God meets us as a caring presence, even in the aftermath of cosmic destruction. Great stones and blocks that speak of certainty and permanence fall to the ground, the mighty thud, making room for new understandings and new possibilities. The second temple that they were standing outside was destroyed in the year 70 in the Common Era. <clears throat> Recently, I had time to live amongst the hardness of stones and to see the different contours and outcomes and reactions to destruction and disaster. Last month, as many of you know, I once again traveled to the small island off Iona. Yes, this is an Iona story, I'm afraid. <laughs> once again. <laughs> but a travel I did to this little island off the west coast of Scotland. There's been a Christian presence on this our little island since Columba and his group of monks arrived from Ireland in the year 563 in the Common Era. They set up a community on the island and then proceeded to send out missionary monks to the mainland of Scotland and England. While on Iona, I stayed in a big stone building 
called the Iona Abbey building. The abbey was originally built in the 12th century as a home for a Benedictine order of monks. It was built over the site, it was covered the site where Columba and his monks had first lived. But 400 years later, disaster occurs. In the 16th century, this abbey and the monastic buildings attached to it were dismantled by the zealous Scottish reformers. The roof was removed and the monks left. In time, the villagers picked up the fallen stones to use for making their own homes and sheep grazed among the ruins. In the early 20th century, many years later, the church part of this abbey was restored by public subscription. But then it got more interesting. In 1938, along came a man called George MacLeod. He was quite a character, but he was also a visionary Presbyterian minister who had been working amongst the poor and the unemployed in Glasgow. In 1938, he brought a group of seminary students, men of course, and unemployed laborers from Glasgow to participate in the restoration of the monastic buildings attached to this abbey. All these men lived and worked and worshiped together side by side over a long period of time and of course, a unique community was formed. Today, this rebuilt abbey is now the home for an ecumenical organization called the Iona Community, and I am an associate member of that community. This community doesn't just live in the, the abbey, it is dedicated to offering radical hospitality to all who come. It is deeply invested in peacemaking and seeking justice for the poor, the refugee, and the oppressed. The once fallen stones now house a new community with new dreams. Just down the road from the abbey are the remains of the nunnery. It was also destroyed in the 16th century, around the same time, by those zealous Scottish reformers. <laughs> Yet, no effort, no efforts were made to rebuild it or restore it. Yet, there it stands, just the ruins left, and it is one of the most evocative places on the island. A reminder of a community of women who lived and served here for over 400 years, yet very little is known about them. Quite a comparison to the abbey up the road. The ruins stand as a defiant reminder of all women of faith who serve but have so often been relegated to the periphery. Stones cropped up in other ways. We all know, hear much about how huge stone churches, glorious in their design and wonderful history, now stand empty and crumbling. Any trip around Europe will show you that. A clergy friend of mine in the UK told me that 85% of his church's time energy and money is spent trying to prop up their historic building. Some churches, as we know, have locked their doors and walked away, leaving va these vast stone edifices to an unknown future. It has all become too much. Others have developed a more ingenious approach while traveling in Scotland, I visited a large and very aged church 
in the small town where I was staying. When I walked around it, I saw that its very high walls needed repairing. They were actually disintegrating and pieces of the building material had fallen onto the pavement below. I decided to look further. I was surprised to find this church open. I wondered if it might be awaiting demolition. I received further surprises when I entered. In the narthex were tables and chairs arranged as if for an afternoon tea or a coffee event. It felt welcoming and spoke of efforts to relate to the passing peoples of the town. Then I entered the sanctuary, the church area. It was high, very dark and daunting, yet an effort of renewal had been made. The pews had been removed and bright red upholstered chairs formed a semicircle around a small altar table. The chairs were strategically placed around the large structural braces that held up the two pillars within the church, presumably holding up the roof as well. It felt friendly and manageable as I sat there, so long as you didn't raise your eyes to the high, dark, crumbling, dangerous looking walls above. I left this church glad that I had ventured in, but asking the question, is this renewal or is it denial? Well, maybe they are in the process of learning how to live when the walls do come tumbling down. We at St. Lawrence are about to embark on some renovation work. I hope I haven't got you too scared by this stage. Nothing, there's not going to be nothing apocalyptic about our work, <laughs> glad to say, and there will be no falling masonry. But there will be changes, and changes can be challenging. But today we are urged to see change, even drastic change, as containing something of a gift. <coughs> Within it is possibility. Today's scriptures assure us that the divine presence dwells in the crucible of change and longs to lead us to a renewed and larger vision. Change invites us to be participants in building a new world, a place where all will flourish and live in love and peace. To finish, I'm going to go back to that visionary man, George MacLeod. For all his intense focus on stones and rebuilding, he, if every wall should crumble, and every church decay, we are your habitation. Nearer are you than breathing, closer than hands and feet. Ours are the eyes with which you, in the mystery, look out with compassion on the world. Take us outside, O Christ, outside holiness, out to where soldiers curse and nations clash at the crossroads of the world. So shall this building continue to be justified. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen.